way is to engage in an activity for enjoyment and recreation. So in order for play to be play, what I like to call pure play, the activity must be something engaged in for enjoyment and recreation without a seriousness or a practical purpose. Now, of course, most of us as adults would consider that to be an absolute waste of time. Welcome, everyone. Here we are again for another episode of the Create, Play, Live podcast. I am Nanette Saylor, your host. And today I have a special guest with me, Kathy Magnuson from Wildwood Learning. And she and I are going to have a very interesting and I believe insightful conversation about creative expression in the education environment, in the learning environment, specifically in this space of how it is that we deeply explore ideas and what that practice looks like when we're coming of age and how we then translate those tools and those experiences into our lives as adults. And of course, you know, I'm a big fan of saying that we need to continue to hold on to our childhood energy and childlike energy of play. And so um, I'm super excited to have Kathy with us today to talk about what that is in her day-to-day practice in her learning and educational business. So welcome, Kathy. Welcome, welcome. Do share with us a little bit about yourself. Help our listeners get to know you from the start. Yeah, thank you, Nanette. I am Kathy Magnuson. I have a business, Wildwood Learning Coaching and Consulting. And in my business, I'm working with schools and nonprofits and helping them create empowering learning opportunities and experiences for the youth that they work with. And I come to this work with uh, 25 years of experience in teaching, both formal and informal. I started out in the classroom as a science teacher, Mm. and science in my mind is all about asking questions and wondering and curiosity, and so bringing those things into all the aspects of learning. And I also have four children. They're all teens and older young adults. So it's fun to kind of see how that has changed over their lives as we have explored things together as a family and then how that's changed as they've gotten older. And as myself as a parent, how I've had to change as more of a facilitator, a consultant with them. Mm, Isn't that interesting to think of the role as parent as consultant. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yes. Not always the easiest thing. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. You know, you're so right because there is that point in time where we transition from being the person who delivers the answers to being the person who encourages the questions. Right. Exactly. Yes. And, And to have the and to trust that it's going to be okay when we push the little birds out of the nest if you will and say go find your own answers i think is um that's the hardest part really in in my experience of being a a parent Uh, my little girl is now 31 years old so (laughs) she's been out of the nest for a little while and she was always one that was um testing the waters a lot (laughs) In unusual and creative ways. Yes. I would have to remind myself that this is what I had always wanted for her, right? Mm -hmm. As as scary as sometimes that would be. Um, I, as a parent, I always dreamed that my child would be the one who questioned, not the one who took for just as, as automatic that things were as they seemed. So... Yeah, so not always easy being on the end of it when you're being the one that's being questioned. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes, of course. Yes. Mom, why do you think that that's true? I don't yes. believe that that's true. In fact, I can show you that it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Very fun. So talk to us a little bit about 
how you explore with the groups that you work with, how, what are, where are some of the areas that you see opportunity for people to peel the layers back a little bit mm. and to take a little different look at or approach to um, the way that they uh, expand their views on a particular subject or area. Yeah, and I have worked with uh, youth and high school, middle school is kind of the air, you know, the age I really enjoy doing that because you can do activities with them and they are at the point where it's not always concrete, you know, so you can mm. get some of those deeper answers from them yeah. and they, they can look a little bit more into being insightful and more self-aware. And we do that. And I've been building curriculum around girls leadership and empowering girls, you know, young girls and women, young women. And by doing that in sub, you know, several different ways, we've done it in ways where we've taken them out of their environment. So we have traveled to a larger city. I'm in a very rural area mm. and we've traveled to a larger city and been on a larger college campus and did leadership activities with them and brought them together as a team. And then also looking at like what their strengths are and how they can use those strengths in the community when they go back into their yeah. rural communities doing community service and activities and and things like that that's been really powerful along with having follow-up kind of conversations with them and helping them kind of dig deeper into those those strengths and I have seen so many girls come out of programming like that just having a stronger sense of self mm. and we do that with like activities we had uh, it I'm really into experiential learning. Yeah. So games, but games that have challenges behind them. And can you, you give us can an example of one? Sure. Yeah, we have this one game. It's called, you can either call it gutter ball or sometimes I call it the spaghetti factory. Oh. And they have to work together as a team and they get like pipes that are cut in half. So they're plastic, the plastic mm -hmm. PVC pipes, and they have to work together as a team to take the meatballs and put them into a large vat of spaghetti sauce at the end, which okay. happens to just be buckets, you know? Yes. But then there's a series of rules that the ends of your pipes can't touch. And if you have a meatball in your pipe, you can't walk with it. You have to pass it on to another, um, another person on your team mm. and so it creates this whole awareness of like conversation around what happens when you get really frustrated yeah. or when you get to that heightened sense of where it, it's all about speed and we have to go as fast because we want to get as many meatballs into the yeah into the spaghetti sauce before it ends and and then having them come back and reflect upon it and see what you know what could what worked what didn't work how could you change what are you hearing yourself yeah. say what are you hearing your teammates say mm -hmm. yes yes yeah. i love those exercises in the in the um the processing okay. yes what you, what, the particularly what are you hearing yourself say mm -hmm. i think is such a great one because it, both out loud and internally yeah, there's a lot of dialogue that goes on in that gameplay space that is really important to unravel for all of us to understand how it is that we're interacting. My mom always used to tell us when we were kids, if you really want to get to know someone, play a game with them. Mm, because yes. <laughs> you, will, you will see quickly their strengths and their weaknesses you will mm -hmm. see are they somebody who likes to play fair or are they somebody who's gets frustrated when they lose are they you know all of those things and um, i think it's a really interesting arena for us to be able to use that and you know and it and it's unfortunate that as adults that's one of those things we give up right how many of us still play board games i know in our family we do and i know i'm kind of weird that way but 
Yeah. Well, I don't know. We occasionally do too. My one son really enjoys board games. And so, yeah, yeah he, he likes to have it where he brings out several board games or brings them over and we have a board game night. But yeah. Yes. And I think some of that is kind of coming back because of the uh, increase in technology and it requires face to face communication and yeah. skills as what, how do you communicate and how do you work together and all of those sort of things. Did you have a favorite board game as a child? Well, we would play Monopoly, which yes. would go on for long periods of time <laughs> to the point where you, you sometimes would want to lose because it was getting really yes. too long. But I also like the game Clue. Oh, I loved Clue. That Clue was one was, of my favorites. Yeah, I think Clue was play. probably, uh, Clue was my favorite, I think. Monopoly, I enjoyed, but I would get bored with the length of it. Uh, after, yeah. And I wasn't, um, I, I, I wasn't a, a, a robber baron or the, you know, the, the kind <laughs> that really wanted to collect all the properties. I just wanted to go around the board and, and see, you know, I thought it was fun that the colors matched up, but right. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't care exactly how many houses I had. That really didn't matter. So I had a hard time with that competitive aspect of it. Yes. Uh, a clue for me was a lot more fun because here I could imagine the story taking place mm -hmm. in, you know, each of the rooms and, and that, um, and the problem solving aspect of that, I think right. was without the competitive piece. I mean, obviously there is some competition because somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose, but in Monopoly, it could get a little bit crazy. And mm -hmm. in my circle of friends, people would get very concerned with keeping their assets in play. <laughs> yeah. And, and that, that was just never how I wanted to operate. So. Right. Yeah. Parcheesi yeah. was another one too that we yeah, really enjoyed. Parcheesi was an interesting one. I yeah. never embraced that one. And I'm not quite sure why. It was in our repertoire, but it wasn't one that I would go to regularly um we had uh oh, what was the th there was a one with connect it was a stand up oh connect four connect four yes yep. that one i liked a lot and i think there was another black and white um straight version i think maybe called othello oh yeah like that mm -hmm. yep, we had that othello. one too and yep. i liked mastermind with the little pegs and the colors oh yeah that yeah, was fun where that you, for... yeah, that, that was a problem solving one too, where you had to kind of guess the, the sequence of the mm -hmm. way it was put together. Yeah. And not yeah. too long ago, I had the opportunity to play Battleship again. Oh with, yeah, we played with, that. Yeah, yeah. With, a, with a young boy. And that was really, really fun because I hadn't done that in a long time. Right. Yeah. You say, so. oh, you sunk, sunk my Battleship. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and yet there's all this strategy and, you know, the, all of those things of trying to, to mm -hmm. work through the, the logic of it all, which is one of those um, deep learning processes, I think that, that we take away from those games, this understanding of how to continue to work to a solution um, and hopefully not get too frustrated by where, you know, so this one didn't work. Now we try something new. This one didn't work. We try something new. This one didn't work. Let's try something new. <coughs> Excuse me. And until we, we get to an answer. And what I like about like the game I was explaining, the Spaghetti Factory game yes. is that it's it's a cooperative game. So yes. it's one of those things that we use when we're trying to do team building or how do you interact or work with others and and then taking that those those reflective pieces and then asking the girls or the kids I'm working with you know, how do you see this in your own life? You yes. know, what happens when people start yelling and getting overly excited or mm. start yelling at you you know how do you perform then and what happens to your body and and having them kind of reflect on times where this is a safe place that we did it but how about some other places that this yes might happen? yeah and then and to give them an opportunity to connect mm -hmm. to how they can use this experience they can remember this experience to help them navigate their way through 
those other environments. Right. Yeah, that's a yeah. beautiful thing. So what do you think as it, as it relates to leadership and creativity, where do you think the creative expression is most um, desirable, I guess, in, in the process of developing yourself as a leader? How do, how, how do you support the girls to mm -hmm. step into this part of their identity? Yeah, one of the things that we say is that you're a leader in exactly who you are. So helping the girls really know themselves and become self-aware. And we use a couple different tools. One is Strengths Finders. Yes. We really enjoy the Strengths Finder. And we do a lot of activities and debriefing and reflection on your strengths and what those look like and how that might come out in, in the story of your life. So mm -hmm. lots of times our strengths, we, they're right there. And yeah. we don't recognize them because they come to us so easily. They're so natural. But when we start telling stories about times in our lives, then I have um, called myself a, a story listener because mm -hmm. then I'm listening for those strengths within those, those stories. And so helping people and just girls and women and youth in general know that those strengths are there. Yeah, that if you can take those strengths and you can put some time and develop them, that they can be the things that you can rely on when it comes to creativity, when it comes to leadership, when it comes to uh, interacting with other people. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So that's where we kind of go with is that, elite, you know, we always have this idea that leaders are the people out front and they're the ones that are doing the work and that they're the ones, but really there's all different kinds of leaders and you can be a leader. Yes. Yeah. I think that's such an important message that you can be a leader without being the person who was voted president of your class. Yes. Right. right. Because there can only be one president of your class. Right. But you have to have all these other opportunities and, and then too, finding that, those interests and those passions that you can really build into opportunities to use your strengths. I think it's such a beautiful program that you're offering because I see it in my own work. I work mostly with women like me who midlife woke up and had spent 20, 30 years covering up their strengths, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And so it's such a delight for me to see that we're speaking language now quite loudly relative to women and girls and leadership and finding these things and claiming the things that are your own and not from the perspective of you need to look like this or you need to be like this but from that perspective of who you are, what, what is core for you and to help allow that to percolate and bubble up to the surface and then find the way to connect that to an expression that serves not only you, but the, the world around you. Right, yeah. So and that you're going out there and you're using them in a way that, that yeah, feels you, feels yes. you know, other yeah. people and, and I have seen that the girls who have been in the program, when I've posted things about strengths, I had one of the girls reply on LinkedIn. She's yeah. now on LinkedIn. And before wow. she, you know, she was in high school and she says, I look at my strengths all the time. She goes, yeah. in my career, I go back, I look at them, I read about them. She goes, I use them all the time. And I think yeah. too, once you know what your strengths are, then you can figure out who you need on your team to help you. Yes. We talk yes. about with the girls too, about yeah. you can't do it all. There's right. people who are like really high achievers and they think they have to do it all or need to do it all or be perfect in yes. all of it. Yes. And you can't. Right. And you know? yeah, the, one yeah. of my, one of, one of the things I think that is the most powerful outcome of any of those kinds of trainings and testings and identifiers is that you begin to see how it's possible for you to surround yourself with others who are supportive and who fill the gaps. 
right? So that you now can create a group that functions cohesively and you have an opportunity to, um, to appreciate each other's strengths in a way that is supportive of the collective rather than competitive, right? So yeah, that's super fun. And it's so, great learning for the girls because our society is so highly competitive yeah, that yeah. to have these opportunities to know that you need to rely on one another instead yeah. of cutting each other down, you need yeah. to build each other up. Right. Yeah. Right. And to create linkage that mm-hmm. then creates leverage, right? It <laughs> makes it possible for, for us to do greater and greater things, right? Yes. So, yeah. yeah. Very, very cool. Well, yeah, it's, um, of course, what comes to mind is, is all the awareness now that, and you and I have talked about this a little bit previously, all the awareness now that the Western woman is going to rule the world, right? You know, and yeah. that's not been, that's not new news, but yeah. now we're really starting to see it come to be true that uh, we, we know more and more that the strengths that we as women bring to the table are strengths that support consistent collective up-leveling as opposed to separate fiefdom societies, which is what our historically male-dominated environment did. And not that one is necessarily right or wrong. However, for me, the collective one feels a whole lot better. And maybe it's just because I'm a woman, but whatever. I'll I'll go with it. (laughs) (laughs) And I think there's places to be be collaborative and collective and then there's places to be competitive and that we just have to know those boundaries or those lines or those places that that um that happens yes agree yeah yeah agreed so I always love to ask my audience one of the things that I do in my work and one of my favorite workshops is to engage adults in play around uh, superpowers mm. and superheroes. And it's interesting that once in a while I'll, I'll lob the question out to a group and say, you know, what, what I'm going to invite you to do is to craft something that represents you as your favorite superhero or you with your strengths as, as a character that you're going to create. And every now and then I'll get one or two people in a group who, who can't grab onto that concept. Mm-hmm. And that always surprises me. <laughs> it hasn't yet happened to me with any of my podcast guests. So I want to want to put that out to you and ask you, have you, did you ever play with this idea of superpowers and superheroes? And how has that evolved in your world? Yeah. And in fact, we have uh, used the theme of superpowers when we have talked about strengths, that these are superpowers. But when my kids were little, they're now all teens and young adults, but when they were little, we each created our own personal superhero. So that was like something we did. I don't know. We were doing a conversation and it was during the summertime. And if you had a superpower, what would you have? And what would be your name? And so my name was Mumu Shapu. And I said, my superpower would be that with a snap of the fingers, everything would be cleaned up. So of course, a mom of young (laughs) children would definitely have that. that. Yes. Yes. And that I could multiply myself, which Uh, of course, I still wish I could do that. You know, both of those things. But yeah. And then my sons created their own uh, superheroes too. And it's been quite a while. I can't remember what their superpowers were, but it was just a a fun activity that we were doing. And then every once in a while we would bring those back up in our, in our conversation. And as we were yeah. doing our adventures and yeah. I, I love the concept because it really allows us without a lot of attachment to anything that we, we know in our day to day, right. It really allows us to think in a new way and to say, okay, so if there were no limits, if there were no boundaries, if there was no definition of what's possible or not possible for me as a human being, what, what would I choose? And I think it's a great exercise to continue to push that envelope, right? And to say, yeah. okay, so, so if 
if there were absolutely no limits, what, what would I create today? And, and how might it be possible? And would I want this for myself? Would I want this for other people? Would I, would I, um, you know, would I want to change the world or, or for today, am I happy just making it be that I can clean my house in right. blink of an eye? Right? <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's, it's always interesting to see. Um, and what I've, I really enjoyed lately is trying to be very much in the space of each day is a new one that I'm trying not to carry forward things from yesterday. Mm. If I wake up today and I feel like going left, I go left. If I feel like going right, I go right. And I'm trying not to hold attachment to the things that have been and not too much attachment to um, uh, the idea of something in the future so that I'm, I'm staying in this place of just exploring what is. And uh, so are there any games that you play with the girls that are, that you can think of that are, that are based around this idea of exploring what is? Hmm. Wow. That's a great question. Exploring what is being more kind of like mindful. Yes. Yeah. 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 Mindful, present. Yeah. Uh, just as opposed to saying, well, if I do this, this, and this, then that, mm -hmm. which is one, you know, that's the science exploration, right? Right. That's, yep. That's the yep. whole experiment. Yep. If this, then, <laughs> you know, then that. Um, this other, uh, the presence, I guess the question would be, um, you know, with this particular, in this conti particular container, maybe what if? Yeah, I don't know. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, you know, and that brings up a great question, you know, how do we create, create just being in the present moment? That's always a hard one for me, because one of the things I really like to do is think of ideas and think in yeah. the future and what that would look like. And I get really super excited about ideas and, and to just stay right in the present moment can get to be something that I have to work on yeah. and bringing in talking. We do talk a little bit uh, about being mindful, about breathing, about staying mm -hmm. in the present moment, how that works with the brain science because yeah. that calms your brain down and gets you into the thinking part of your brain, the mm -hmm. prefrontal cortex, all of those sort of things. Um, you know, we like to bring those in. We've even done things like uh, some yoga. Mm hmm and having them experience yoga. Some have never experienced it before. And so having them do that with a little bit of, of breathing exercises and we make the breathing exercises fun. So yeah. it's like, be like you're carrying a beach ball and, you know, inflate it, <laughs> deflate it. And we have a whole bunch of different kinds of, you know, pretend you're smelling a cup of hot chocolate and mm, there you take go. a deep breath, you know, so all of those story things to kind of start implementing, how do you get back to that present moment? Yeah. You now, uh, I think, you know, it's hard, if it's hard for adults to let go of attachment, it's mm. hard, it's hard for kids, you yes. know, and I don't, I don't believe in asking kids to do things uh, that I myself can't do or aren't <laughs> able to or willing to try yes. to try to do so yes I do practice mindfulness I do have yoga I'm into yoga I'm into having time to do meditation and journal writing and quiet time and nature is a huge one for me just being out in yes. nature and incorporating some radical downtime we do talk like especially with the older girls about like yes. how do you incorporate just some downtime because so often kids are just scheduled to oh, the and, minute yeah and there is no downtime and if there is downtime it's you know going on snapchat or scrolling through instagram or yeah you know, how do you just like kind of push that to the side for even a few minutes yeah and and I love this little. idea of radical downtime. Mm -hmm. Describe that a little bit more for me. Well, that's not my term, yeah. <laughs> but I've read, uh, I've read a book called Self-Driven Child 
And if anybody is a parent out there of children, mm. it's a great book. It's by Ned Johnson and Dr. William Stinsrud, Stinsrud, I think is how you say his last name. Anyhow, reading about that and they talk about things like sleep, how important it is for your kids to get sleep and mm. to have that downtime and the time to daydream and yeah. read. And, and I'm a kid, you know, that grew up in the 70s, 80s. So we didn't have as all of these techno uh, yeah, technological we distractions. distractions. Yeah. yeah. And I grew up on a farm. So we had, right. you know, lots of time where we were out with our animals or riding our bike or um, I remember I would just take my book and go and sit in a corner, sit yeah. outside, read. Yeah, I had a favorite place in the woods, yeah. a big rock that was in the middle of this little stream, and I would take a book out there and just sit and read on the rock and be out there for hours right. by myself, just me and the stream and whatever happened to wander by. And uh, yeah, and I, I, I wish for today's children that they have more of those experiences. Yeah, yes. definitely, definitely, yeah, definitely. you know, and as parents that we recognize how important those experiences were for ourselves yes. yes and how we can help our kids to have those same type of experiences yeah it's interesting when when you mentioned you know, we didn't have the same distractions i remember that at 11 o'clock after the after the evening news television went off mm. you know, there wasn't anything else and in certain parts of the country where we would go to our summer house, we only had three channels on the yeah. television because we picked it up on an antenna and two of those channels came from Canada and they were French. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. you know, I know. So there was, you know, and, it and grandma would go and turn the antenna dial to try to pick up another <laughs> channel that got English. And, and, you know, the truth is that even today, I was just having this conversation with someone a couple of weeks ago. My mom just went up to our lake house and one of my cousins was there trying to help her get set up. And she called me and she said, well, how does, how do I connect the television? And I had to admit that I had no idea <laughs> that, you know, I said, honestly, when I go there, I've always gone there, never watched television because it was never part of my growing up days when I was there. Yeah. So occasionally someone else will have turned it on and I'll be in the living room because it's a small camp and a small space and some show yep. will be on and I might watch it. I said, but I'm not sure I could even turn it off if you know, <laughs> left by myself. And it was a really interesting awareness to know that in all these years of my life and in recent history, we have a satellite dish, we have direct TV, we get three yeah. channels, you know, all of that. I still don't know how to turn the television. I don't know how to work it. And <laughs> it's because I don't have any desire to, because mm -hmm. when I'm there, I want that radical downtime, right? I, I want to relish in the fact that I don't have to be connected. Yeah. And in so many other times and places in my life, I don't have that luxury. So, and I'm also aware that I have the memory of that piece as a child. Mm -hmm. My, my fear is that today's children don't have that memory. Right. Yeah. I think, you know, more and more so, and it gets harder and harder as they get to be teens. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we have a lake cabin also, and my phone doesn't work up there because it's in yeah. Canada. Yeah. And just having them come up there now as teens, it's boring for them. Yeah. 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 You know, there's all this stuff you can do, but nope, it's boring for them. But luckily at the very beginning, we didn't allow them to have their technology up there and yeah. they left their phones and they left their yeah. stuff and, and we guarded that time as this is fun family time and they had a great, you know, younger, they had a great time up there. Now, you know, they need to, they want to socialize. Things have changed. Their priorities yeah. have changed. And so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah but still we, helping them to notice that they need to have some downtime sleep. That yes. sort of stuff. Yeah. It's so all important. of those things. So talk to me about, I know you mentioned nature, you've mentioned journaling. You, I'm a 
big fan of using journaling as a way to come to self-awareness. And we're talking a lot about self-awareness with, with young girls. And certainly um, as we move into adulthood and we start mm -hmm. to navigate our way through all of the, the peaks and valleys of life, um, I'm a big fan of using my journal to help me hear what's in my head. Mm -hmm. um, so talk to me a little bit about your practice, your journaling practice and, and how that how do you how do you incorporate those pieces of nature into it? Yeah, I have done journaling over I don't know fifteen years. I was never mm. a journal. I never really kept a journal when I was young. But as yeah. I got older, and some of the things that had happened in my life, I needed an outlet and a place to kind of let those words and those feelings and and things go. Yeah. And I've done nature journaling where I've taken a sketchbook and I'll go out and I'll just sketch, you know, what I see in nature and not worry about what it looks like because it's mm. only for me. Yes. So it doesn't matter what it looks like or even finding poetry or other things that I really enjoy and taping them into my book. I also really enjoy making my own journal covers. And so like I will do collaging on my journal covers. I will just buy these cheap lined English journals that you can get for 50 cents. And yeah, the composition ones. That's the what composition I ones. Yeah. yeah. And then I will do the front oh, and the back and I will cut things out of magazines or things that I see to, that represent what I want and what my values are. And then I just take a, a tape, like the uh, packing tape, mm -hmm. and put over it in strips so it doesn't come off. And yeah. so that every time I pick this up, I see things that are important to me and that I want to be reminded of yeah. in my business. And I make personal ones, too. And vision boards, I love vision boards too. And yeah. it always, it seems like on my vision boards, and I don't know if I do this consciously or not, there's always elements of nature. Mm. And um, there's always yeah. outdoors or nature or butterflies or, yes. or birds or flowers or colors or things of that sort. So my journaling practice has varied over the years. And I maybe don't write in it every day, but I like to do things like prompts. I use mm. cards. I have several different kinds of cards. I have uh, Julia Cameron's cards from The Artist Artist's Way. Way. Yes. I'll pull them and I'll write, you know, I'll read the saying and write about that. Or I have angel cards, you know, different mm -hmm. things like that just to kind of get my juices flowing. And, and then I just yeah. write. Yes. Yeah, I, I love using the um, inspiration of just grabbing something, anything that, that and I had keep a little basket where I drop things that catch my attention, might be a poem, might just be an expression, a quote, might just um, one I remember was an ad for a Toyota car, you know, but there was some expression and some energy on it that really caught my eye. And so when I Often I, use, I practice Julia Cameron's morning pages, which mm, yeah. is just to sit and write. And that's yeah. really most typically what I do. But there are times where I want to ply my craft, if you will, of exploring a question. And um, I'll do that with a prompt of some kind, yeah. either a quote or a prompt from a book. I also use, uh, I practice access consciousness. Oh. And so I use a lot of the access questions to, yeah. to, to, to inform sometimes how I want to write. It's interesting, though, I will notice that I've gotten so comfortable in my free form morning pages that it feels more like work, for lack of a better description, for me to, it's almost like a school assignment if I give mm. myself a prompt. You know, it, it right. feels... It feels more like I have to come up with the right answer, which is just an interesting thing to notice how hardwired that response is from mm -hmm. my training, if you will, as a student in school. And I think that's why what you're doing is so important because it was so ingrained in me 
that I had to get it right. Right. Mm -hmm. I had to get it right. That there was, there was definitively a right answer and I had to have it. (laughs) And that's a really uncomfortable place to be, you know, a lot of stress built around that. Yeah. And especially in today's world Mm -hmm. uh, to help our children unravel that and to recognize that there's more than one way. There isn't necessarily always just one that's right. And we can explore lots of possibilities that may be today the, the, the response. And tomorrow, it might be a different one. And I think that's, um, that's part of why I enjoy now uh, encouraging myself to be in this practice of starting each day new. Mm. Because yeah. then I'm disconnecting that hardwired part of me that is still challenging me to get it right. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so I, I can be in this space of um, noticing when that voice is speaking to me and then using the tools that I've learned to adopt in my adulthood to manage challenging that. Right. And I think that's, you know, that's the other thing that, um, that I, I I want to invite you to speak to a little bit, how nurturing our creative strengths helps us to challenge anything. Right. Yeah. I was going to say status quo, but it doesn't even have to be that. I think the, I think the, the, the deep learning, the, the real yeah. exploration comes when we challenge the thing that is supposed to be so, right? Yeah. And I think- there a, Are there special strengths that mm-hmm. you emphasize for that? I think, you know, being curious yeah. and asking, asking why, why mm. is that? Uh, and not in a way that's damaging because why can be also a tricky question about, yeah. you know, you know, why are you doing that? But more in the way of why or what, what do you like about that? Yeah. Yeah. You know, tell me more. Yes. Or why, why is math your favorite subject or, yes. why, you know, so using that to kind of dig a little deeper and being curious and, hmm, yeah. I think too, wondering with our kids and wondering with them out loud, like, I wonder how we could make that happen. You know, one one of the things that just happened recently is my daughter graduated from high school, but she went to Denmark her Mm -hmm. senior year, the first half of her senior year as an exchange student. And she was a senior in high school and that's not done real often, but we had known some people who had. And then when she had brought up that she was interested in that, I said, Hmm, I wonder how you could make that happen. Yes. I wonder if we could talk to, you know, these other people that we know, I wonder, you know, what would you have to have in place at school so that you could still graduate on time? Yes. You know, all of these questions. And so her and I went exploring together. And what I liked about that is that it wasn't me pushing her. It was just me helping her facilitate and thinking about what do you need to know to make this happen in your life? And continuing to ask new questions to invite her to get in, to take the next step. Right. Yeah. And so just helping your kids kind of wonder and I think sometimes too, not right away saying, oh, you can't do that. Right. Or, you know, going oh, to that's Dan- not possible. That's not possible. How would you ever think of doing that? Yeah. Right. You know, why yeah, would you want to do that? that? Right. All that right. sort of stuff. And maybe she wouldn't have gone to Denmark because it wouldn't have been able to do that. But at least right. she would have maybe some information that she could use if she wanted to do it later in her life yes. or explore it. Yes. Later in their life. So I think just helping our kids wonder and not, not totally cut them down right away. Yeah. It's a great yeah, and way. I think as you're talking, what I'm, what I'm remembering um, as 
something that was a shift for me in my way of thinking and using my curiosity and allowing, giving myself permission to use it was in the beginning, I, when I wondered, when I began down the path of taking steps, I still had this fixed notion that that meant I had to go all the way to the end, Mm, right? If I started this thing, then I didn't give myself permission to stop anywhere. Right. So it it didn't re I wasn't really giving myself the opportunity to explore all possibilities, one of which might be, oh, this question has now made it feel like this isn't really the right time for this. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. I wouldn't have given myself that permission. I would have just listened for the thing, the go signals. Because I had already, once I had stepped forward, I'd already decided that because I had vocalized it, that now it meant I was a failure if I didn't go through with it. Yeah. See, and and so it took a while for me to recognize that that's what was happening. Yeah. And then to give myself permission to say, wait a minute, you can still explore. You can go all the way almost to the end. In fact, you can go to the end and then say, mm, nope, back. I, I don't, I don't want this. Right. Mm-hmm. I've, I've recognized now I don't want this. I can come back t- to where I was before or, you know, come back three steps or whatever else might be possible. And that was a really important lesson for me and an important shift in, in allowing myself to explore because Previously, I was very attached to what the potential outcome was, Mm -hmm. and I was already formulating what it was. And the truth is, we don't know what it is (laughs) until we put all the pieces together. We just think we know what it is. And most of the time, it doesn't turn out like what we no. think we know it yes. is. Yeah, no, I know. It doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> yeah. So life gets a whole lot easier for me anyway, when I started yeah. to recognize that pattern in myself and to see, okay, so just like, let, let that go. You can take a step that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to take 10 more. Mm-hmm. It just means you're taking this one. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> and for me, one of my top strengths is called ideation so I get like really excited yeah. about ideas and I had to recognize in myself too that just because I say the idea doesn't mean I have to do it or that right. it's going to happen you know yes. because at times I would feel like a failure because right. I said these all these ideas and I can't act on all of them because right. I have way too many of them yes. but then recognizing too yeah that it's like I can have all these ideas, but I don't have to carry them through. Right. I don't have to act on all of them. No, no, <laughs> no, no. In fact, it's um, it, it would it would be by most people's standards impossible. Yeah, and uh, that's I, where my journaling comes in, and it's really great too yeah. because I can write them all down, and then yeah, yes, they're yes. out. I don't know if you follow uh, James Altucher at all. He no. has a, a podcast. He's an author of a bunch of books. He's a stand-up comedian. He's also a financial wizard. Oh. Um, he has a book called Choose Yourself um, and then the Choose Yourself Guide to Wealth. Anyway, one of his daily practices is to write down 10 ideas, just 10 crazy ah. ideas. And it doesn't matter what they are, just anything to start your day with 10 new ideas. And he I, I just, in fact, created a little meme with one of his quotes on it that I, I'm, I'm not going to get it exactly, but it goes something like this. I have lots of ideas. How do I choose which one? And he says, well, start executing on all of them. The <laughs> one will choose you. Ah. Which is interesting. Right. Yeah. 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 It's an huh. interesting perspective. And it's this idea that, okay, so you just just allow them to all be. And at some point, one will bubble up and the others will fall away. And that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of fun. Ah, Cool. Yes, yes, yes. So what special projects are you working on right now? What are you excited about? 
Ah, great question. I have been doing some presentations at different education conference. I really oh. love alternative education. I yeah. think those are the people that get um, get what I am talking about and get about excited about how we can make education learner centered or more focused on what the student needs and and yes. their rather than what the system needs than what the system <laughs> needs yeah and our system it needs to change because yeah. we need to incorporate people who have creativity and that have no what they want where they want to go with that and what they get really excited about and and all of those things so i've been working with teachers and other nonprofits and that work with youth and helping them to also see their strengths because i think we have to start there at that point yes. is if you're a teacher and you don't know what your strengths are and then you're trying to help students find out what their strengths are so helping them to see their strengths and then also allowing them to be curious about how you could use this and yes. help students use it and how can you spread the strengths within your students yes and use those to create learning experiences for them and opportunities because you know and i think that's the best way people learn I mean, that's the way I learn is like, I, I can read about it. I can watch it on YouTube. I can, you know, but once I experience it, yeah, then, you know, that's great. Yeah. And so really bringing like a, a spark of joy into learning mm -hmm. and yeah. sparking, sparking this little fires all around as far as like getting kids excited too. You know, yeah, but I, I think, think you first have to get teachers excited and yes. the people who are working with the youth excited. And so, yes. yeah, that's what I've been working on is doing different uh, conferences and present, presenting about strengths and presenting about, you know, how you can bring those into the, the classroom. And so is this where you use the strengths finders tool? Yeah, and I have created some other tools uh, going on doing StrengthsFinder can get a little bit expensive. And if you're at a conference, you have about like an hour. So mm. I've created some tools that you can use that are more kind of like yourself being self aware. It's like a little quiz and oh, what, what areas right. you belong in and, and things like that. And then we use those with other activities. And when I do the conference, when I do my conferences, I, I am truly a facilitator of the learning yes. and I am not the one up front talking yes. to you continuously. Yes. So I just, I just don't teach that way. And yes. so, yes. yeah, those are the things that I'm really working on and, you know, finding both the uh, teachers and schools that work with youth and and doing trainings and workshops with them and then also coming in and doing similar trainings and workshops with youth too and nice. young and young adults so yeah all Excellent. focused on leadership and are you doing this across the country are you doing it internationally Do sure I could. <laughs> yeah. One of my one of the things I love to do is travel and adventure. So oh, you know, beautiful. if anybody wants to invite me to come, I will come. You'll be there. <laughs> I'll yeah. be there. <laughs> yes, it's fun. I I just I had some dialogue with with someone last week who said, "Oh, I would love to come to one of your workshops." And what I presented back, I think I surprised her a little bit. I said, "Well, if you can get a collective of people to come together where you are." I will gladly come to you, you mm -hmm. know, and yeah. we'll work that out. So it's kind of fun to think about that. And, and again, that comes from that practice of continually allowing yourself to explore other, other possibilities than the traditional, oh, you have to have a workshop, it's in your backyard, you're coming here. But, but, you know, there are all these other ways that um, you can provide the support and uh, I think that's a beautiful thing. So yeah. excellent, excellent, excellent. So what are you creating these days? Anything fun you're working on as, an, as what would be more um, of an artistic outlet, if anything at all? Yeah, <clears throat> it's been summer. Yes. And so as an artistic outlet, yeah, I enjoy doing flower gardening. And oh. I'm sad to say that I didn't 
get to that point. We had so many other things going on in our neck of the woods. I'm in northern Minnesota, and so now it's mid-July, and it's like, mm, do I even attempt because, you know, they to put flowers in but it's warm isn't it, it surprisingly oh, yes. yes and rainy it's been warm and rainy yeah. yeah yeah i know in our upstate new york home same thing extraordinarily yeah. warm and very rainy and so very, yeah. very different summer season exactly yeah. so you know as far as like that sort of thing i i think you know flower gardening is like an artistic endeavor oh you know, absolutely. picking out the flowers i really enjoy doing that putting yeah. together in the planters seeing what you know happens and when they bloom yeah. yeah yeah but as far as like other things no that's that's as far as my summer has gotten <laughs> there you go well and you know, and and um yeah i there's something really special about gardening i think i uh, the last two seasons i've had a little bit of an herb garden going out on my patio out here and uh, i have a unique challenge in that i live close to the ocean so the salt air is tough on my plants mm. and um, summer sun in Florida, of course, is hot. You know, is hot, and so I've had to had to devise this very interesting way of being able to move my plants around so that in the morning they get sun over here, and in the afternoon over there, and it's just a little space. But um, it it really reminds me how much attention we can give to nurturing something, right? And mm -hmm. and the whole idea of sprouting i sprouted some of these herbs from seed i hadn't done that in a long long time and and I, you know, it it really gave me opportunity to see how much joy came from this mm -hmm. seemingly silly little thing i mean it, you could have just one little dish that had seeds in it and if that's all that sprouted and grew into something for someone who's never had that experience before, um, it, it, it's an amazingly creative activity. Mm -hmm. And I think most of us wouldn't think of it like that because yeah. here, we, here we are, we're nurturing this, we're birthing it, we're helping it to, to bloom. We're actually watching it grow right before our eyes. And yet, there's so many elements of it that are outside of our control. So it really gives us an interesting opportunity to manage our own expectations mm -hmm. and, the, and the intersection of that with what's happening in this very natural process. So yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's been fun for me and to also recognize, so now I'm into summer and I had a little green pepper plant and it got these fairly marginalized green peppers on it, but it did mm -hmm. get some green peppers on it. And then I had to accept that now it's time for that to be done because yes. there are no more green peppers that will grow in August and September in Florida. <laughs> 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 At least not on my porch. Yeah. And, uh, and so that's a whole nother process, right? Getting, mm -hmm. getting comfortable with acknowledging that this cycle is done. And that doesn't mean it wasn't a successful cycle. It just means that this one is done and then it's time will come again. And I think there's some, some really powerful lessons in the gardening uh, environment for um, how we move through the cycles of our creative lives and our creative projects. So thanks for sharing and, that. Yeah, and I know too with myself, I love to learn and then yeah. I'll learn something, I'll be with it for a little bit, and then I'm on to the next thing. So, you know, yeah. I did some hand lettering, and then, you know, I did that for a while, and now I'm on to the next thing, and yeah, yeah, yeah. and just being able to to be okay with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever. I'm never going to be an expert hand letter, or expert gardener, or expert knitter. That's mm -hmm. just not who I am. Yeah, and yet that doesn't mean you can't enjoy it. And exactly in fully engaged yep. and really honoring that activity for yourself. And I think that's, thank you for sharing that because yeah. so often in the pursuit of creative activities, I hear people say, well, I'm, I can't do that because I'll never be able to give it enough attention to be really good at it. Mm. And to that, I would say, so what? 
right? Right. <laughs> so what? Yeah, just explore, it's, have fun yeah, if you enjoy yeah. it. And you know, yeah. when you don't, or just let it go. Right. And, and it, it makes me sad when people don't give themselves the opportunity to even see what it would feel like uh-huh. or what the experience would sense like or, or be like because they're afraid that they won't get to be an expert. Yeah. And yeah, so, so thank you for sharing that because I think it's a really <laughs> important point in our conversation about uh, nurturing your creative expression and particularly for uh, people later in life who have already had experiences. Many of the women that I work with, part of the reason they don't do any of the activities they used to like to do is because somewhere along the line, somebody told them they were no good at it. And they mm-hmm. deeply internalize that. And so now as at later in life, our challenge by challenge to them is to go out and, and try again or try something yeah. new. And this time observe with kindness and yeah. gentleness and remember that that voice is a voice of long ago who no longer exists, who had no business challenging you anyway. And just allow yourself to be in the, the experience of trying something new mm-hmm. and, and just being with it. And I think that it's such a gift for you to be inviting young women into that experience now yeah, with, with guidance and with kindness and compassion and gentleness and in, in a safe environment where they can explore and they can begin to get in touch with those, um, those voices, either external or internal, and, and navigate how they're going to move through that mm-hmm. to continue to express themselves in positive ways. So yeah, yeah very, yeah. very cool. Well, this has been delightful. And I am so glad that we had an opportunity to chat today and to share what you are up to and a little bit of your philosophy and and the experiences. And um, I look forward to posting this up on the createplaylive.com site and then providing a a bunch of resources for everybody based on, on some of the things that we've talked about here. Is there anything in particular you want to share before we wrap up? How uh, certainly please share how people can get in touch with you if they want to explore further, just have a conversation about just education and learning and young girls and girls leadership. And I can already think of a couple of people (laughs) that I, I want to connect with you in our environment here. So yeah, um, I know that there will be others. So please share how, how would you like us to stay connected? Well, I do have a website, which is wildwood learning, W I L D E wood learning.com. So don't forget the E in the middle there. And on there, I have my email address, which is kind of the best way to get a hold of me is to email me. I do have a Facebook page. You can join the Facebook page, which is just Wildwood Learning. I occasionally post on that. I'm on Instagram and I occasionally post on that, but I'm not really very, what do you want to say? I I just do it when I come across things that I want to share with the people who are following me. And so I would say going on my website and uh, finding my email, which is Kathy at wildwoodlearning.com and sending me an email is the best way to keep in touch with me. I have a blog on there that I have been writing on since 2014. So yeah, lots of resources as far as what I do and how I've worked with youth. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, thank you. And I will look forward to us staying connected. And as I I share with all of my guests, I know that there's going to be an opportunity for us to come back and have have a second conversation at Mm. some point in the future as we move forward. So, and if you think of anything else you'd like to share with our audience, please do send that along. And uh, we'll look forward to getting this out into the world in 
not too short order. So <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you, you very get, much again, Nanette, and having me on your podcast. I enjoyed I, our conversation. Yes, you are so welcome. So this is Nanette Saylor signing off for the Create Play Live podcast and saying a huge thank you to my guest, Kathy Magnuson, for joining us today to talk about her passion in learning and education for youth, particularly for young girls. I'm so excited that we have people in the world doing this really, really important and good work. So thank you for all that you are. Much appreciated. Thank you. Bye for now. You are listening to the Create, Play, Live show, where women come together to share how curiosity and creativity lead them to extraordinary lives. I'm your host, Nanette Saylor, and I'm honored to share the mic with some truly amazing women who have asked and answered the question, what if we stop adulting and live every day with the curiosity of a child at play? And these enlightening conversations will invite you to let go of outdated standards, make your own rules, and give yourself permission to play more than ever before. You have the power to create your life. Spend some time with us and you'll learn to see life through new eyes and challenge yourself to new possibilities. We may not solve the world's problems, but we will get you to think differently about your own. Come play with us. Listen and subscribe at createplaylive.com.